Um, anyway, my name is Bill Ouellette, and I'm the Managing Director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. And this is? Stephanie Lampkin, Founder and CEO of Blindor. And this is? I'm Elliot Cohen, Founder and Chief Product Officer at Philpac. And Elliot is clearly the mellowest one in here. So look, um, do I even need this? <laughs> oh, there's another room. OK. Is this being recorded? Yes. <laughs> that means no F-bombs, no Trump comments, you know, all off the record. Uh, all right, so what we wanted to do first was hear what you're interested in. All right? Let, let's hear what you're interested in. Go ahead. Elliot and Stephanie point at them and they'll yell out what they're interested in. Come on, this is participation. Entrepreneurship is not a pet spectator sport. What's that? Medical device. Okay? Transportation. Medical device. I, what? I would like to hear your failure story. Yes. Failure story. Yes. Failure. Yes. Right. Well, well to, get, to hear those, you have to go to Harvard. This is at my <laughs> <laughs> When you went from Harvard, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Access of capital. Access of capital. Leadership challenges. I keep from getting screwed by your DCs. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Elliot, control them. <laughs> Leadership challenges, plural. What else? Crowdfunding relationships with your with your investors. <laughs> Funding uh, relationships with VCs. Managing your board. With VC. Managing your board. Getting talent and keeping talent for the next phase. Recruiting talent? And keeping. And keeping and developing talent. Differences between East and West Coast VC. Okay. East, uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down even a little bit more to say Boston, <laughs> NYC, and then I'll say Silicon Valley. So, no, I, should put, I shouldn't say Silicon Valley. I should say NorCal, right? Stephanie, that's a new cool thing. <laughs> NorCal, because it's San Francisco. It's not Silicon Valley. OK, we got room for three more. Trends. 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 When you switch from startup mode to corporation mode. Switch from what? Startup mode to company mode. Corporation mode. Okay, startup to company scaling. And intrapreneurship. We have room for one more. International market. Go global. Yeah, what's the other one? What's the last one? Global. International market. Global. global. Okay. So here we are going to go completely unscripted. I'm going to take one, then you'll take one, then you'll take one. Okay? We can go through. Are oh, you want a boring? Um, I'm a fake engineer from Harvard. I've been a three time entrepreneur. I worked at IBM and I teach from the Entrepreneurship Center. I also uh, used to be an engineer and uh, started PillPack uh, about five and a half years ago while I was still in business school. Class of? 2013. Uh, Stanford engineer, worked for Microsoft for a while, also class of 13. This is my sec second startup. First one failed while uh, I was at business school. And yeah, now all things Splendor and unconscious bias. Okay. <laughs> so what, what I, I'll, I'm going to take this one. Intrapreneurship, all right? Start the clock and cut me off in two minutes. I have two minutes, all right? Uh, when we first started, our classes were focused, when I first started eight years ago, they were all focused on startups. Entrepreneurship equals startups. And it was like, we always think about the ready-to-go entrepreneur. Our persona were people like Elliot and Stephanie. Today, that makes up 20% of our class. 50% of our class is curious entrepreneurs who want to do it. Our class sizes have expanded dramatically. And curious entrepreneurs don't know whether they want to be 
the person who starts a company, the person who joins a company, the person who joins a corporation and brings entrepreneurial skill set. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger part of it, and we could spend all day, every day, talking about entrepreneurship with big companies. I just came back from Statoil, they just appointed a person to be their corporate entrepreneur. Um, what's, what's happening is startups are getting the low-hanging fruit, and that fruit is good fruit. But to get to the higher fruit, that's bigger fruit, you, you often need corporations to uh, be involved because it requires things like infrastructure, and I think Hillpack is running into this now. You can get so far, but then it's very difficult to recreate distribution channels, to recreate supply chains, to recreate um, the grid if you're in the energy field. To, you know, these things are very difficult, and you have to have access to capital over long periods of time. So this is a big focus of what we're doing. We have a corporate entrepreneurship class at MIT now, and this is a fledgling topic that is not sorted out by anyone yet. All right, Elliot. Less than two minutes. It's amazing. Wow. Well, then, then I, I have some of my cell phone planned for next next topic. That's just the proverbial, like, you have control of the room now. You just want me to pick, pick one. I have yes. a chalk. Is that the idea? Yeah. I'll do relationships with VCs for 100. <laughs> uh, we have really great relationships with all of our investors. Uh, we approach, I, I think the most important part of the process is finding the right investor. I have no advice once you've found the wrong investor for how to figure it out after that, other than you're in trouble. There's probably some really good advice. I have no idea what it is. I really think it's like getting married. Um, you should absolutely think hard about who that investor is ahead of time. You should spend lots of personal time with them. You should really get aligned on your vision. The times when I've seen it be a problem, it really comes down to a difference of opinion about vision. And it gets, it usually the pressure point ends up being around things like how fast you want to burn capital and how much capital you're going to have to raise. <clears throat> and those, to me, are really just facades for vision. Your vision might be, man, we want to grow absolutely as rapidly as possible. We don't care how fast we burn it. Or it might be, man, we want to get to a sustainable, profit-generating company as rapidly as possible so we don't have to dilute ourselves. Those are really big decisions. First and foremost, your founder, your, your other founders and you have to be on board with that. But secondly, you and your investors do. And I think just like any good marriage, there's just so many of those value conversations that you have to have ahead of time. And if you have those, in my experience, then it all goes very smoothly after that. If you have not had those, then you're just constantly talking at sort of cross purposes with each other and uh, prevents you from really getting to build a great relationship and generates lots of arguments. Do you want to add anything to that, Stephanie? No, that was great. Uh, let me just say one other thing with regard to that. You know, uh, this obsession with getting the highest valuation is really a bad idea. Get someone who is going to be a good partner because when you look at the numbers and you see if you're going to raise money, valuation is much less important than getting a good partner that you can work with. That's, so, a, go ahead. that's a really good point. I think actually we, we've, um, I don't know that we've ever taken the highest offer uh, in any of our fundraises. We, we've always chosen partner first and, and valuation second. Our assumption is if it's the right partner, we'll build the right business, and the right business will ultimately be worth way more than the wrong business. So ultimately, the valuation today won't, won't matter as much as the valuation tomorrow. All right, Elliot Cohen for $100. You win. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pick access and capital. So fundraising was by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Uh, ladies, I'm sorry to say, it will be really, really hard. Only about 2% of all venture capital deals go to women. That's 1.5 billion versus about 80 billion for guys. Um, so the way that I kind of got around the fundraising challenges, um, in part, was crowdfunding. I know there was a question about that earlier. But that doesn't really get you much, depending on the type of company. So if you do have a hardware company, something where you're delivering a physical product, you can go that route. If not, you're very limited. I didn't have the benefit of a friends and family round, so I tapped into a lot of angel networks. What's happening in the market now are a lot of big uh, seed stage funds are pushing the risk onto angels. So what was once considered a seed stage is now actually you need to have traction, you need to have customers, you need to have a team, you need to have all these things in place before you can really be a seed stage um, 
venture going for a big institutional capital investor. Um, so we're seeing an emergence of angel investment groups um, targeting everything from social impact to um, certain industries to certain demographics of founders. Um, and that's where I sort of found my niche. Um, I got angel investment money from um, some folks in the HR tech space, some folks specifically uh, focused on women. And it took me a year just to raise um, a little over half a million dollars. And fortunately, I did so much work in the course of that process that now we're closing a Series A and we didn't even actively go out. We had funds coming to us saying, hey, we've been watching your progress through your quarterly updates and we're ready to close in 30 days, no questions asked, like we'll do some due diligence, but like we've just been following you and we think what you're doing is great. Um, that story isn't the same for everyone, um, but my recommendation for access to capital is go as far as you possibly can without raising um, capital beforehand. Um, and leverage your networks. It is, I hate to say this, but the least meritocratic experience I've ever gone through. It's very much about who you know, who makes the introduction, the depth of that relationship, um, and how it aligns with that investor's interests and their investment thesis. Did the MIT network help you? No. It did not. <laughs> wow. Stanford helped. Stanford Health, and you are based on the West Coast? Yeah, I moved from New York to San Francisco because of the the prospects of raising more. But I actually ended up moving there and getting money from the East Coast. Uh -huh. So it was sort of the illusion of like, oh, a Silicon Valley company, yeah. even though um, I had to move to from the East Coast. Very interesting. So what are we going to do about that? Well, let's talk about that next. Boston, New York, and NorCal. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Well done. Check. Check, check. So I think there's always this New York versus Silicon Valley, Boston versus Silicon Valley. Um, this isn't really helpful because entrepreneurs should be helping each other. Um, and, it, it, and when you see people who do good rounds, um, they raise money from different places as well, um, if you can. Now, what's really, I, I'm going to talk about what we're really focused on is, first of all, you know, Northern California with San Francisco and, and um, and Silicon Valley is just much bigger than it is here. When you look at the numbers, it's just much bigger. And there are people who have made tons of money out there, and they're much more willing to just throw money at you in the angel rounds and at later stages. And they're, frankly, more sophisticated in a lot of ways in ability to take risk. I shouldn't say so sophisticated. They're much more willing to take <laughs> risk on things. So the magnitude of this is just much, much bigger than it is in Boston or New York. Now, that being said, you don't have to be one of these against the other one. And I think that's a really unhealthy thing. Um, right now, you know, MIT is not you know, a Boston brand. It's a global brand. And a third of our, our students go out and work in, in uh, Silicon Valley. And so we have a big presence out there as well. So we, if, if, if Elliot said the best place for him to go was Silicon Valley. We would say, we fully support you. Just like if you have a kid and they say, I want to go to the best school, you can go to the best school wherever it is. So we are not focused on you know, picking winners and losers in here. We think that's the wrong way to do it. I will tell you, for those of you who don't know, we have set up a summer startup studio in New York City. And this is working really, really well. Because New York is much different than Boston in a lot of ways. New York is, um, is New Amsterdam. Boston is New, New England. It's an English kind of puritanical you know, way, way to approach things. New York is Dutch, where you've got kind of traders and you know, you know, you've got all kinds of other things, more liberal, shall we say. Uh, in, in, in. And it's 10 times bigger for businesses. So what we have done is not choose one or the other. We have a, a a, a nodes in both places. Obviously, we have a, a very strong node here. We've set one here. And we're seeing terrific value in sending people down there. Why? Because first of all, if you're, in, if you're in digital media, if you're in ad tech, if you're in real estate, if you're in fintech, you're not be being in New York is just at a much higher rate. It's a faster clock speed. There are more customers down there. So our students that are interested in those types of things, they go down there. Great case in point, even one that was here last year, Sigma Ratings is down there. 
Um, and so we take our students and we get them exposure to both of these, and that is very, very helpful. It's networking effects. What is Boston particularly good at? Boston is particularly good at the harder technologies. Not necessarily the consumer-facing ones, um, but it's more often the B2B, you know, robotics types of things, healthcare types of things, energy types of things. This is where we tend to do better. And if you look at our Delta B team, they're not, you know, another dating app or something like that. It's usually, you know, the harder technology. Now, harder technology doesn't necessarily mean better. It, that's just plays to our strengths. We have very good deep technology expertise. We have very strong policy expertise in that, and we have good business expertise. So, um, so those are those I would say. Um, how how are we how are we fixing it? We're trying to build a networks to connect all these together to make. I still believe, and I have to say that I, I believe that money is out there uh, for, for our students. And um, all of our students that I feel should get funded, they get funded. If they don't get funded, then they really um, need to work on their pitches, they need to work on their business cases to get there. So I am not seeing a lack of money right out there now. It's not easy, but nothing in life that's really good should be easy. It shouldn't be easy to raise money. You're asking people for theirs. Elliot, you want to comment on this? Specifically Boston versus other cities? Boston, yeah, Boston compared to other cities, we, not versus. This isn't the Celtics versus the stayed, Warriors. Yeah, we stayed here. I wanted to move back to San Francisco. I'm, I'm from there. And um, before I had started business school, that was my plan was to move back to San Francisco. But uh, for, so, so we've raised capital from uh, Boston, London, and, and San Francisco. And uh, for our first round, it was, it was much better to stay in Boston. Uh, two reasons. One, just it was an early stage round, so being much closer to our investors was really helpful. Yep. Um, Founder Collective, and, and at the time it was called Atlas. For our first two investors, they were like a mile from our office. We had yep. to see them all the time. They were really, really helpful. Um, in addition to that, uh, I do think one, one difference we did see is we frequently went out to the West Coast, and people wanted us to uh, make the thing that we were working on easier in some way. So we were going after this really complicated healthcare use case. They really wanted it to be simplified somehow. They kept asking things like, could you go after vitamins? Could you go after people who only have one medication, not seven medications? Uh, in Boston, the reaction was the opposite. It was like, oh, this is so fascinating that this space is so broken for people who take a lot of medication and have to deal with their insurance companies and their physicians. Let me, let me understand better how you fix that. And so they got really excited about, uh, about what we were working on. I think to the earlier question about finding the right investor, for us, that was the right fit. We wanted people who would press us to go after those really complicated problems, not people who would press us to find uh, a different path, even if that path might simplify in some way. Um, so we, we did see some real differences. I think, by contrast, when we were in later rounds, San Francisco turned out to be a great place to raise money. Yeah. And, uh, and how, much have you, how much have you raised? Can you disclose that? We've raised, uh, yeah, that's, it's public, about 120 million. Yeah. But early on, just going back to it, the key to have Founders Collective and Accomplice in there to that, you know, that close feeding and, and, and fast iterating and building it. Stephanie, we, by the way, we don't have to agree on everything here. Uh, we, have, we all agree we have too many people on the panel. <laughs> Stephanie, you want to comment on the differences? Because you've lived in all three. Yeah, no, I, um, I haven't noticed any significant differ differences, again, because I've been relatively early stage compared to Elliot. Um, but the majority of our investors are here on the East Coast, between Boston and New York. We actually have an investor in Portland um, and a large investor in LA. So I've actually seen uh, more traction overall outside of the major markets of New York, San Francisco. And I think it's just a reflection of, again, kind of going out of network, out of the traditional <laughs> Uh, fundraising path and finding folks willing to take uh, a bit more risk. How many people here are from the, um, the Boston area? How many people are from the uh, California region? Wow, look at that. There's more people from California here than there are from Boston. How many people are from New York? That's less than I would have thought. Wow. Where else, where, where are the other people here from? London. <laughs> Wow, pretty good diversity. <laughs> the interesting thing, by the way, and, 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 and I've been at this a long time, is you know, when, when I grew up, to play, if you were a basketball player and you played basketball in New York City, you basically saw all the good players who played basketball. You'd see Kareem abdul -Jabbar. Anyone would come through back on New York City and you'd see them. When I first started entrepreneurship, if you were in Boston or Silicon Valley, 
basically those were the two places and everyone came through there. If they were good, they moved to those places. This is not true anymore. You're seeing that the, the, it spread out to many, many different places across the country. And that's because of the, the advancement of not just the technology, but the advancement of entrepreneurial ecosystems and capability and knowledge about the field, which is, which is really great. Because I think we as a society you know, have to um, spread out entrepreneurship and not just have it concentrated. But for those of you who don't know, Scott Stern is a, a renowned uh, professor here at MIT, and he researches entrepreneurship. And he did this study called, um, um, I'll remember in a second, uh, the Cartography Project for Entrepreneurship, which measured the intensity of entrepreneurial activity. And when you looked at it, you saw entrepreneurial activity was correlated to, the, it was negatively correlated to people who had just basically lost hope and would do, would vote against their own self-interest in a lot of ways. So really, it was a very, very interesting project. So I think this idea of spreading entrepreneurship out and not having it be so concentrated is a very good thing for our society as well. Okay, Elliot, you're up. Which one will you choose on, on the board? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, let's go for talent. Talent for 100. Did we lose our, our, our chalk? Yeah. yeah. Uh, everyone before I started a company told me that that's where I'd spend most of my time. And I vaguely believed them. And they were wrong. It was so much more than most of my time. It's pretty much the only thing I have done since we started the company. And it's the only thing that I do today. Um, almost everything is in one way, shape, or form either meeting people and recruiting them or trying to figure out what we're missing so I can go recruit the right person, or keeping them once we have them. Uh, so it'll, it'll take up a, a, just a ton of your time. And if it's not taking up a ton of your time, then you're either hiring the wrong people, which means you have to keep doing all the jobs that they're doing, uh, or you're just not spending enough time on it and probably preventing yourself from being able to move as quickly. Um, for us, I think that the keys have been uh, just being really reflective and thoughtful about what types of people we need at different phases. Uh, we, we have to be good at lots of different things. We have to be really good clinicians. We have to be really good ops people, really good software engineers, really good product people. There's a lot of different disciplines that we are required to be good at in order to pull off Popac. And um, so I think for us, it, it requires, there, there just aren't a lot of templates to follow. And therefore, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about who those people are that are going to be right. Once we figure out what that template is, then we just start searching everywhere. So we spend tons and tons of time on LinkedIn. We pay recruiters. Um, I absolutely love recruiters. I think they are a fantastic accelerator. I'm a big fan of them. Um, we start pinging our network. Uh, we start emailing everyone we know. So if you went to school here, you, you would have at least some network here that you can email. Um, I'm constantly emailing old classmates, asking them if they're available or if they know anyone who's available. Uh, and then once you, once you have them, you spend all of your time like getting lunch with them, having one-on-ones with them, and really focusing on communicating vision and trying to make sure they understand the plan. For us, at least, that's the main motivator for people joining. And so it's the thing that we spend a lot of time continuing to communicate after we have them. Um, and then we spend the other half of our time really listening and trying to make sure we understand what is going well or poorly. Um, and I think it's, it's identical to sales. You know, At first, you're out there selling, and you're just like pitching your customer on vision and why you're going to be so wonderful to work with. And then once they become a customer, you spend all your time saying, like, did I, did, did, was I right? <laughs> is it actually awesome to be here? And if not, why not? And um, as we grow, we've had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to scale that activity. So it's easy if we were smaller, we can do that one-on-one. -on -one. As we get bigger, we're constantly thinking about what are the mechanisms we can use that get folks to share those inf that information with us in a really honest way. Um, because as you get bigger, they will get, your, your team will get less honest with you. At least that's my experience. Absolutely um, true. Just don't know you as well. They don't have this personal relationship with you. It's just harder for them to be uh, as direct and as frank with you. And so you have to think creatively about how to make them feel comfortable doing that. Stephanie, you want to comment on this? This yeah, is in your I've, wheelhouse. I've, yeah, exactly. Um, I've been fortunate to get a lot of free press, which has helped recruiting tremendously because we're such a mission-driven company. Um, and so free we, press includes front, front, a cover of Wired magazine, right? Uh, is that Wired magazine? Cover of been? MIT Tech Review, Tech Review. The Atlantic. Um, I've been in Delta Sky, like just a is that all? <laughs> a bunch <laughs> of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think millennials over time are growing more and more um, intentional about wanting to work for companies that are changing the world for the better and like not just um, moving pixels and doing the basic things 
uh, for Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. And so we've been very um, we've been very intentional about making sure that we communicate exactly what our mission is, what our direction is. Um, and so we've had a lot of a lot of folks come to us and apply for jobs. And on the retention side, um, just making sh making things as flexible as possible, and really um, sort of walking the walk around diversity and inclusion and belonging, um, which has been really great for us. Like we have a software engineer who's in. Uh, Netherlands and Philly, who's been excellent um, and very engaged. So, so yeah. It's really, it's really so, how many employees do you have now? There are nine of us. Nine of us. How many do you have, Elliot? We're somewhere north of 850. 850 employees. <laughs> and, and I just want to make an observation that I, as someone watching this with the students coming out, the one the companies that succeed. So, if you look at PillPack, if you look at Okta, which I think is five and a half billion, more than five and a half billion dollars now. Um, you look at HubSpot. All, if, you, if you look at the, those people who came out, they obsessed about this fact, that you know, recruiting and keeping talent, and they kept saying the word culture to the point where people were sick of it. You know? And that culture is incredibly important to be able to scale because you can't be there. When the company gets to a certain point, the silent supervisor in the room is the culture of making decisions of what they will do and what they will not do and who to hire. You can't be involved in all that. The other thing that I would say is very important, and this bodes, I think bodes very well for you, Stephanie, is that the, the CEO believes deeply in recruiting and is the number one salesperson for the company for the raison d'etre. Raison d'etre is Spanish for reason for existing. Um, Right. I know that was a joke. That was a joke, all right? <laughs> We're not that unsophisticated here, right? <laughs> but, but we always talk to our students, what's your raison d'etre? It, it can't just be about money. It has to be about why is the world a better place because PillPack exists? Why is this good for our customers? Why is this good for you as employees? And you have to, if you don't believe in that, if you're not totally authentic about it, you will not make a great company. And you know, this is kind of the existential, because the elevator doesn't always go up when you're in a startup. I mean, this is the existential crisis that Uber had. And when the elevator didn't keep going up, it started going down. When it goes down, sometimes it goes down and the cable seems broken. And anyone who's not, doesn't, isn't there for more than the money, doesn't really believe in it, they're getting off. And that's when you need your best people the most. So kudos to, to you guys, and, and just the, you know, the success of I think what we're seeing now with our companies is this, you know, belief, you know, belief that we're we're not just here to make money. We're, we're we're here to make this a better place. Making money is a good thing. It's part of the process, but we're about, about much more than that. All right. Well done. Well done, Elliot. Um. I knew I knew you were going to pick that one. <laughs> Uh, so I'll go for leadership challenges. So we touched on this already with recruiting, which is one of the, the biggest challenges. But um, I actually read something recently that did a study around traits of the most effective leaders in the world. We oftentimes think it's the MIT grads, and it's correlated with all these things that um, we think are important. And actually, the most common are just the ability to make decisions quickly and be confident and stick with it. Um, so hiring and firing are one of those things, like firing someone that you know isn't a good fit right away. Um, but even just like long-term vision decisions about the company, product decisions. Um, so for me, at an earlier stage, uh, I think it's even more critical around the direction of the company because it dictates um, a lot of different things. Our ability to continue to fundraise, our ability to grow um, as an enterprise SaaS company. Um, and oftentimes, you're, it's just you. Sure, you have a board. Um, the things you can't always tell your board. You have advisors. You have Bill Allette. <laughs> um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, the decision comes down to you. And you have to be well advised and make the decision quickly with great conviction. And so um, yeah, those are that's probably my biggest favorite. Can you elaborate on this? I mean, people think, oh, it's glorious to be a CEO. Can you, can you kind of deal with that a little bit? Because I, I, I tell people that. Yeah, I mean, it's, chief, it's not all glorious. It's chief everything officer. Your sales, I'm in the code, I'm the janitor, I'm the HR person. And you aren't really primed for juggling all of these different things because we are very domain driven in our education. Um, and so when you're in this position, you kind of have to figure out, figure things out, build a plane while you're flying it. And you make a lot of mistakes, but you have to make them quickly and recover quickly. 
Um, I think that's the key to it more than anything. Ellie, oh, you, you too. I mean, it's a lot of, sometimes when you're running a company, just so we're clear, it's not glorious. Everybody else goes home and you're stuck with this problem that's incredibly important and it might, the company might not make it if you don't solve this problem. And you cannot freak out. You just cannot freak out. And you can't even act like you would possibly freak out if someone says, how's it going? You're like, great, great, we can't wait for Monday. But you have no idea what you're going to do before Monday, you're standing at this cliff because if you freak out, everybody else freaks out, right? <laughs> <laughs> or does the elevator always go up at Pill Pack? <laughs> Gen generally up to the right. Uh, no, I think um, uh, we. Uh, it's generally been up to the right, but you've had some very hard threats to you. We, um, you've had taken some punches, right? <coughs> uh, there was a period maybe two and a half years into the company um, that was pretty stressful. And uh, I was talking to my mom about it on the phone one time. She's, she's my closest mentor. And uh, she, she said something that I thought really stuck with me. She said, yeah, well, if you've got the right team, then only the hardest problems come to you. Because everybody solved everything else along the way. And it really, it really landed for me. And I was like, yeah, you're totally right which means then my day is nothing but problems that are just really hard to solve. And I have really smart people. They're way smarter than I am. So if they couldn't solve the problem, by the time it makes it to me, it's like kind of an intractable, intractable problem. And um, that, there, were, there were a couple of things that I really had to, to change in that moment. Uh, one, I started figuring out that uh, management and leadership are not the same thing, have almost nothing to do with each other. And uh, my job is to be a leader, not necessarily a manager. It doesn't mean I'm never going to be a manager. There might be moments when I am. Um, and particularly uh, for a company that's moving really quickly, there's always going to be gaps uh, between in your team. There's just stuff you, you haven't realized you have to be good at yet. So you didn't hire anybody for it. You didn't build a team around it. There's no department for it. And those are usually the stickiest problems, because they show up. And there just isn't really someone available to, to solve them. And uh, so, so what you what you end up having to do, I, I think actually, uh, is you have to uh, try to do as little as possible most of the time. Um, because you have to be highly available to solve the problems that are both urgent, uh, unsolvable by anybody else, and between all the gaps in the rest of your, your group. That was really hard for me to do. I'm, I'm, you know, I think most good engineers, they love like really digging in and owning a problem. Um, we, we're all naturally overachievers, so we fill our day full of work. We don't feel like we're doing a good job. We're not working really long hours. Um, I think as you as you grow as a company, uh, the leadership of the company really needs to both get out of the weeds in order to deliver, you know, enable ownership at a lower level. But almost more importantly than that, you have to save your own time for the problems that no one else can solve. And since you won't know when those are going to come up, you just have to be highly available at all times. I don't know if Elliot agrees with this, but another challenge I have too is somewhat being a horse with blinders on, given that so many of our peers are in the startup space and just there's so much noise around what's happening. Um, people are getting funding, people are crashing, people are starting new things that are in direct competition with what you're doing, and sometimes it's challenging to just sort of cut through the noise and focus on your priorities because it's almost like you're running in a race and there are people who are doing things and ex excelling at things and you don't know exactly why. Um, and you may try to pivot based on that with limited information, but it can take you completely off course. Um, so it's challenging to just kind of really narrow in and focus when there's so much happening outside of what your day-to-day -day company is. I think that's a little different in Boston. I think there's less of that here. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually am the least plugged into the startup community I've ever been in my life. I, I used to work for Bill for a year. I was super plugged in. That was, that was my job. Um, before Bill, I was in Seattle, and same thing, I was very connected to the startup community. Uh, in Boston, it's, it, for whatever reason, it's actually really easy to put blinders on and just focus on pill pack. Um, and there's just basically nobody else to really connect with and talk about, uh, which has its downsides. But the, the upside of it is I, I, I rarely feel like, oh, man, but this person over here, you know, they just raised a ton of money, and they're doing it differently. Maybe we should copy them. Uh, for better or worse, I, I think we're much more isolated. I'd, I'd say there's two things out of that. And, and I think, Stephanie, is, you're going through this now. You can get invited to an infinite number of talk speeches and talks. And, and you have to be careful. Th this one you should always accept. If I call you, you should always accept it. But you have to be very careful, because your, you, you, your job is to run the company. Your job is, to, is to not to be busy, as Elliot just said. 
uh, John Wooden said, never confuse activity with achievement. Your job is to get stuff done. And, um, and this is kind of one of the things uh, that, you, that you learn in the process. I love that, Elliot. Because we all are like hyper you know, active and we want to work all day. And that can kill you because if you overbook yourself and then that crisis comes up that only you can solve as, as the founder or the leader, and you have no bandwidth, um, you're not doing the job that you're, that you're supposed to do. Which will lead me to? I have one other just small yeah. thing that's slipped in there. This is the advice, uh, probably the single piece of advice I wish I had gotten really early on, is get a coach. Coaches are awesome. I think every discipline, everywhere on the planet, you should always have a coach. It's all Gawande talked about this in surgery recently. And I just think it applies everywhere. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, it applies even more because you're doing a bunch of different jobs that no one's done in quite that configuration before. They're expensive. You may not be able to afford it early on in the company, and that's totally fine. You can probably get it through friends and mentors. But at some point, as soon as you can afford it, uh, hire a professional coach. Like so, a life coach? Or like no, no, no. A, 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 a business coach. A business coach. Yeah. 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 So yeah, they will sound like a therapist. So I mean, they will be like a life coach, <laughs> but their job is to be your life coach for how you do your job. Remember, he came from California. He's one of these kind of. So well, well, well done, well done, Stephanie. Leadership. We could go all day on that. I want to pick this one off because I've got I. <laughs> Um, I'm on boards now, and I um, have been tried and worked with boards as running companies and done a good job and done a poor job. I, I, I want to uh, make sure I, I stick to two minutes on this. Um, the first thing you have to understand is, going back, building off what Elliot just said, you have coaches, you have specialists, you have mentors, you have investors and you have boards. These all serve different things. What's the role of the board? Hope everyone in this room knows. The number one job of the board is what? Hire the CEO. To hire and fire the CEO. <laughs> that is, it's nose in, hands out. Their job is to hold the, 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 the CEO accountable for what they're doing. This is an accountability. They're not your friends. If you want a friend, get a dog. Get a nice golden retriever and you'll have a nice friend. The board is not your friend. They're not your coach. They're not your mentor. They're not there to help you with legal problems. Their job is to hold you accountable because they have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. And if you mix that up, shame on you. Shame on you. Um, five minute warning. Oh my God. What does that mean? We're done in five minutes? Okay. All right, so maybe I should just stop there. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll just give you the headline. Board equals accountability. Just like if you want to know what the investor's job is, it is not to be your coach. It is not to be your mentor unless, unless it serves the goal of the investor. What's the goal of the investor? R-O-I-I-R-R. I mean, you got to simplify these things down. I, I'm a, I studied system dynamics. I don't know how many of you did here. I love system dynamics. It is fantastic. I don't dislike people. Some of my best friends are people. I like you. Um, but they say stupid things, and you just have to look at the way the system is designed and understand the incentives. Yeah, and just for tactical things, I treat my board kind of like I treated my manager before applying to Sloan, where I understand like what is the rubric, like what are the metrics and information that I can equip you with to advocate for me. Um, and just constantly, well not constantly, quarterly providing updates and being as transparent as possible. I want to add a tiny bit to this because I disagree with Bill somewhat. Uh, your board, there's no, there's no question about it. Your board's job is, uh, is to be have fiduciary responsibility over the company. So they have to deliver IRR to their LPs, and they're going to hire and fire the CEO. That is where they sort of start and finish from an accountability and a responsibility perspective. Every board member is going to approach how to do that job differently. Many of them will approach it from a perspective of mentoring, coaching, and helping support you. And I think to Stephanie's point, you have to think about how do I want to relate to my board? And there's no right or wrong answer. Some people I know have really deep mentorship-like relationships with their board because that's the way they 
hear from and, and can understand the advice the best. Some people have a much more arm's length relationship with their board and it's much more about managing their expectations and communicating uh, what they should expect from you very clearly so they can hold you accountable for those things. It's much more of, a, um, of an unemotional relationship. There's nothing right or wrong about either one of those. You just have to figure out what you want that relationship with your board to be, and then you have to figure out what the mechanisms and tools are that are going to create that for you. I, I, would, I would agree with, I, I, I don't want to, dis, I'm not disagreeing. Oh, we weren't supposed to agree. Yeah, but I would just say it's not in your interest to have a bad relationship with the board at all. You have to find a way, but you have to understand their number one thing is they, when, you, when they're looking at you, it's basically a job interview, that that's their number one responsibility. Should they keep you, should they not keep you? There was a request here to talk about failure. Um, I don't really think of, I mean, there are certainly things that I could point to and say those, those were probably failures in the sense that we didn't achieve the immediate goal we were getting to. Um, they really don't feel like failures. Uh, so I think this is my, my, my personal answer to how you deal with failure. Uh, you just have to understand what you were trying to get out of the situation. When it doesn't turn out the way that you want it to, then uh, you just you just move on. Uh, it's like Bill was mentioning earlier. You know, you're the founder, and something doesn't go the right way. You just got to pick yourself up the next day and move on. You can't lie about it. No one's going to trust you if everything's roses all the time, because clearly it's not. But there's a big difference between acknowledging that something didn't go quite the way you expected or wanted it to, and then painting the picture for how to move forward, and actually treating something like a true failure. I think when you think of it as failure, you'll dwell on it, and you'll live in it for way too long. Um, and that's not healthy for anybody. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for anyone else. Um, you, you can diagnose it. Probably you shouldn't do that in the moment. Um, you can do that later on. Uh, in the moment, it's, it's mostly about acknowledgement, uh, so people feel like you're being transparent and honest, and then figure out what you need to do next, and then just do that. It's really that's, for me, it's really that simple. I just, I just want to say one thing. I hear these, I go to these conferences, you're up next, is um, people, someone before me one time said, embrace failure. And I got up after us, I said, really, I've got to disagree with the previous speaker. They're better looking than me, but that is terrible advice. Um, if failure was so great, the New York Mets would be the greatest baseball team of all time, and I can assure you they are not. Failure sucks. You better hate failure, <laughs> because you're not in this game to fail. Failure is something that is part of the process, but if you like it, you will become a loser. And you're not there to be a loser. You're there to hate it and then learn from it. And as Alex just said, you lose on Tuesday and you, and you don't like it. And you wake up on Wednesday morning and say, I'm not going to allow that to happen again. But you can't get wrapped around the axle. You have to somewhat be like a, we teach the students improv humor now. Like, throw a joke out here. If that doesn't work, OK, that's fine. We're just going to come back over here. But I'll never tell that joke again unless I fix it, right? OK. I'm going to choose this one in part because I'm really eager to hear Elliot's response. Um, start up to actual company scaling. So we're actually right at this transition. It doesn't really happen overnight. But when you start realizing that, oh, I have to really get my lawyers involved in a lot of decision making, payroll, benefits, um, board issues, um, having sort of infrastructure in place so that you're having repeatable things happen over time. So we're doing that right now with our sales strategy because we were primarily, sales team was led by me and all of my greatness. Um, but realized we were closing deals primarily because of that. But now that I have to hire a sales team and actually have repeatable um, practices, we have to put a, a lot more structure. It's not as, as simple as just getting leads um, and closing based off the, the allure of what we do. Um, and I think for, for us, that's really been the biggest transition from startup to actual real business, real company. Elliot? Great time. Uh, we're, we're supposed to be done, but the first rule of entrepreneurship is that all rules are optional. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't like this framing. I think this is the wrong way to think about uh, creating and building a company. Startups to me have, uh, there, there's two ways to think about what that word means. One is our uh, philosophical or cultural perspective. Um, it's never accepting the status quo. It's always changing the way that you're behaving in order to achieve something new. The second thing it can mean is uh, messiness, lack of structure, no mechanisms, no hierarchy. Um, I actually don't think it should ever mean the latter category. It doesn't matter how big or small you are, you always have a series of tools and mechanisms necessary to get the work in front of you done. Now, if you're eight or nine people, 
and you're, everything you're trying is new, well, you're not going to have a bunch of mechanisms and processes in place because you haven't done it before. So you don't know exactly what the right process is. So it's true, more of your daily life is going to be unstructured. When you get bigger, more and more of the company is, you know, you know what you're doing. And now you want to make sure it happens really repeatedly. So you're going to put a bunch of process in place in order to make that happen. But you still should have other areas of your company that are totally new, trying new stuff. You don't have a lot of process around them, and they don't necessarily work the exact same way. And I, I think you, you want to, the things that we usually ascribe to a later stage company, you should pull more of those into your early stages. You should be more conscious right from the beginning about the right way to get something done, the right way to assign decision-making authority, the right hierarchy to have in place. And when you're later on in your life as a company, you should still maintain that same philosophy of just get shit done and don't let any of the processes or, or rules get in life. But you do need to start bringing in some management. I think you said it very, very well. You do this idea of just chaos. That's like that, the part, part to get it going. But then you have to kind of be very disciplined about how you grow the company. I think it's definitely true that you will probably be more chaotic by definition early on than you will be later on. But yeah. I think the acceptance that we have of eight-person companies being chaotic is the wrong philosophy. Yeah. And by contrast, the acceptance that we have that we're now big and everything should be perfectly structured that doesn't make any sense either. And I think it gets in the way of us making progress because if you're growing really fast, you do need a lot of structure, which you're going to change every quarter or two. Yep. And if your whole attitude is like, hey, we need a really good process in place, then all of a sudden changing those processes gets really challenging to do. If what you communicate to everybody is, yeah, to get something done, you had better be clear about what that process is, and you had better be really open-minded about changing it, because we might be different tomorrow, then I think you buy the right cultural context for the company to continue making changes along the way in order to stay connected with your ultimate vision, which is serving the customer as best as possible. So let me start to wrap up with first a comment. That sounds fantastic. You know, and this is the kind of stuff we're looking at at MIT. And we're, we're thoughtful people like Elliot Cohen are just make us so proud. And in fact, we're bringing Elliot Cohen back to help teach a class on just what he was speaking about right there next semester. So we're super excited. It hasn't been announced. I guess it's just been announced. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, this is the way that MIT is going to approach this issue. And I'll also mention just this morning, I woke up and there was an article in the, in the uh, Economist about can entrepreneurship be taught. And I, and, I, and I see these articles and I'm always like, oh, God, you know, here we go. Entrepreneurship can't be taught. It's just a messy thing, which is just rubbish. The data bears out that's not true. But that actually is a very good article. And in that, Vanessa Green is in there, and Billicus is in there. And they talk about, yes, MBAs teach you very important things to be successful in entrepreneurship. And Bill Gurley from Benchmark Capital was the, is probably renowned to be the most successful entrepreneur right now in the world. He was the one with Uber and Stitch Fix. And well, so he had to shake about Bill Gurley. He is uh, quite a legend. He came here and gave a talk. And he said, you know, it's interesting. Um, someone asked a question, or MBA is relevant. He said, you know, it's interesting. I get that question a lot. And I see you know, so much deal flow in, in Silicon Valley. And he said, you know, the number one thing these teams need is an MBA. <laughs> because they don't understand how to systematically go to market with it. They, they know there's a hole in the, pro, in, the, in the market. They've got some idea that's pretty good. But they don't have a systematic way to go to market on it. So I think that the, you're seeing the successes of, of companies coming out of Sloan being higher is not an accident. And so, um, so thank you all for coming. I know we cannot end this without saying the word blockchain, so we have just said it. <laughs> um, and we'll summarize that. We'll, we'll, we'll end with, Elliot, can you give us your tweet on blockchain? Oh, I still don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie? Um, my tweet on blockchain, uh, I think it will stabilize, and when it does, it'll be great. <laughs> yeah. I, by the way, I went to a conference and all these people were talking about blockchain. I go, man, I'm just so dumb. And I went up and asked them afterwards. They didn't understand what they were talking about. And they were so you've got thousands of people about blockchain. So here's the summary of blockchain from my standpoint, because we hear this all the time, the trends, is don't go to cryptocurrency. Look at blockchain. Blockchain is a fundamentally interesting technology. But if you want to look to where the most interesting thing right now is how you work with data. How do you work with this enormous you know, data, machine learning and that type of stuff? That's even, that's even more interesting. That's where the action is. 
But you know where the action is even more? It's right here at MIT. So, thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Stephanie.